Hey, good evening. Uh, we're starting a little late. We had a bit of a glitch, but we're here anyway. Always, always, we'll, we meet our adversaries. Anyway, welcome to the Equality Garden Club annual meeting. I'm sorry, a meeting of, of uh, March the 17th. Uh, last month, um, we had our meeting right after Mardi Gras. And tonight, we have it on St. Patty's Day. So I hope everybody's enjoying themselves and they're in the green. I'm not in the green, right? My background self here is something of the a future hope of spring, the agapanthus in the background. That's from last year. I'm only hoping that it'll be as pretty this year. And I hope your gardens are all prospering. On tonight's agenda, just to keep you, uh, you'll know the, the regular order of things. Uh, the, after my remarks, you'll see, uh, be introducing uh, Paul Durbin, who will be introducing our speaker. But before that, we'll be having a special vote on uh, that will be uh, we'll talk about in just a, in a few moments and this is about the upcoming uh, uncommon and unusual plant auction and uh, Rick Leitner will be talking to you in just a few minutes about uh, right after me anyway after the presentation we'll be encouraging questions from the members right and, uh, and, and enjoy yourself there and then we'll announce next month's program which will be the uh, the, the plant auction and then I'll close with a few closing remarks, all right? But just to make sure there's anybody who's new to this and not, is not familiar with our system here, uh, we'd like you for courtesy's sake, please keep your audios on mute. Do not try and talk on them because it's disturbing. And the same is true of your video cameras, keep them off, all right? Mm -hmm. If by any chance you have a time lag between the speakers, it's not uncommon. It happens. I mean, sometimes these little glitches. Uh, it's not your fault. Probably ours. Be patient, and we'll reconnect with you as soon as we can. It'll just be a bright moment. Now, if you're joining us on Zoom, <clears throat> you can post your questions at the, uh, uh, for the speaker uh, through the chat button. That's on the laptop. That's going to be located at the bottom of your screen, right? Uh, remember that when you're putting your, uh, any comments into chatting, you're chatting to everybody. So uh, keep it clean, keep it good, keep it nice. All right. Uh, if by any chance you're on Zoom and you get disconnected, you can just rejoin. Don't worry about that. Though, just the way you did in the first place, and we'll just readmit you into the pro uh, into the uh, program. Now, if you're joining us on Facebook Live, you can post questions as a comment in the video. Right. And we're asking you to make sure that you share that video so, uh, so everybody else can join and we can have the most people possible. We have two moderators each hand, uh, for each platform, one for each platform. Paul, Paul Durbin is going to be assisting and collecting questions submitted by the audience through the Zoom chat. And Mario Rios will be assisting and collecting questions submitted through the Facebook Live. All right. And just a reminder, we are recording this, uh, this program. And we are archiving it, the meeting on our website. So if you find it particularly interesting, or if you really if you want to go back and you want you don't you forgot something like your notes or whatever, uh, you can easily renew uh, review the presentation by going to the Equality Garden Club uh, .com, All right. So sit back, you can enjoy the thing, and if you want to, you can go back and refresh your memories on it. Now I need to give you some a couple of updates and fairly important ones, I might add. Uh, normally, our popular and very successful annual plant auction would be held over the following our tropical plant fair. Unfortunately, because of the COVID, we postponed it until November of this year. And so the board has scheduled the EGC's rare uh, and plant auction, and we've renamed it, and we're calling it now the unusual and uncommon plant auction. And this is because it has a wider variety of things and rarity was too hard to get, but we wanted to go on, but we have found really unusual and very uncommon plants, so, uh, certainly for your enjoyment. At any rate, that's going to be in lieu of our general meeting, uh, membership meeting, which we normally held on April. And at this auction, we're going to, be, we expect the public uh, to add to our membership and, and, and the enthusiastic bidding on this variety of tropical trees, foliage, and flowering plants. So to accommodate that larger than normal meeting, we're going to have to go through what we call a Facebook group session, not the normal Zoom thing like we're having right now. Uh, we, I won't get into the dirty details on that, but that is just a technical problem to accommodate a much larger audience uh, and, and to be able to bid and all the rest of it. 
Anyway, the details on how to participate in that auction is going to be sent to every member. And we're also going to be promoting it on various internet platforms. So you will be finding out exactly how to sign up and how to participate if you, if you so choose. Now, Rick Leitner is a committee chair of the Unusual and Uncommon Plan Auction. And he is going to come on board right now. And he's going to give you a rundown of what the plans are. And so you're up to speed with how we're, uh, how we're approaching this major event for our club. Okay, Rick, are you there? I'm here. Okay. Uh, I'm Rick Leitner. For those of you that do not know me, uh, I am the uh, auctioneer as well as the chairman for this unusual and uncommon plant auction. Um, it is slated for Wednesday, uh, the 21st of April, beginning at 6.30 p.m. and running till approximately 8.30 um, as Van mentioned, we do have a lot of very unusual things. There are about five or six of us plant scouts out, and we're actually looking for the rare, the unusual, and the uncommon. Justin, um, our marketing and IT guru, has decided and quite successfully gone with a freak show circus theme, so we're going to play up with that. What has happened as we look for these unusual and um, uncommon plants because they are such, a lot of the nurserymen and women might only have one or two of these particular plants. So they're hard to part with. And of course the price is high. So what, I'm, uh, what I did is I approached the board for a, an allotment of $2,500 as a budget, which may be used, which may not be used up to $2,500 to purchase these plants for the unusual and uncommon auction. Now, this is not only for plant purchases, there's some behind the scenes cost as well. So I want the general membership to basically understand that there's marketing materials or some, um, uh, some uh, other things that need to be purchased to get this uh, virtual auction um, off the ground. So what I'm asking the general membership to do, and you'll see uh, a, a general vote pop up on the screen here in a minute, is for 25 additional hundred or $2,500 as a budget, which as I said, may be used, may not be used in regards to purchasing these plants. Um, all plants will be auctioned um, to the highest bidder. Uh, I do not anticipate um, this going any longer than two hours. I want it to move fast and swiftly. Um, so we are looking at anywhere between 70 and approximately 90 pieces of plants, everything from orchids, flowering trees, vines, um, bromeliads, palm trees, the, you name it, we're going to have it. So as I said, five or six of us have been in the fields, in the nurseries, trying to scout out for the unusual and the uncommon. So what I'd like to do right now is make a quick motion. Um, for $2,500 to be accepted by the general membership as a budget for this, uh, rare, this unusual and uncommon plant virtual auction to take place next month, April 21st, which is a Wednesday evening from 6.30 until approximately 8.30 at the latest. So you see now there is a, um, an approval, either yes or no on your screen. Uh, please tap either yes or no at this time is there a second to my motion for acceptance of twenty five hundred dollars yes i second it that's paul durbin seconding just a few more moments for everybody to get on board to uh either vote yes or no for the addition for the twenty five hundred dollars for the budget as i said before we may not use twenty five hundred dollars but we are going to spend up to, but no more than 2,500. I'm not sure if you can see it, Rick, but we're at 17 of 19 votes. Okay, I cannot see that. Yeah, I, I voted, I've lost it as well. Okay, we're waiting on two more people to vote that are online. There will be a list, Amy, of plants available. Um, there will be flyers made. We're going to try to market this as much as possible. Um, but we are attempting to send a list out um, 
a few days before the actual auction so you can take a look at what's on the auction block. And Rick, we have already started putting that list together and yes. likely make it live early and okay. just add to it as we can. Yeah. And a Amy, to answer your question a little bit more, we will also be posting photos along with some descriptions of some of the plants in advance to get people more interested. So if you do have particular ones you're interested in, you know, by all means. I'm, so just trying to figure, I'm just trying to figure out how I can be the auctioneer and bid at the same time. I'm <laughs> going to try to figure this out. <laughs> so we have all 18 votes and they all came in as yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you guys. Those are the results from the poll. So Rick, who are we handing this back to? Is it Paul? Handing, yes, back to Paul. Perfect. Okay, are we ready for the speaker? I believe so. Okay, um, our speaker tonight is uh, Rose Bouchard Butman. She's the natural, res or her title is natural resource specialist. Um, and she's going to give a talk on nature scaping for birds and butterflies. Um, as the Naturescape Broward Program Manager, Rose organizes programs and community projects that support sustainable landscapes and wildlife habitat. Rose is a certified arborist, Florida master gardener, and a national wildlife habitat steward. She is a member of many boards and advisory committees. Rose was a member of the initial task force for Naturescaping Broward and is active in the National Wildlife Federation Flyways Coalition. Her home is registered as a National, a National Wildlife Federation Backyard Wildlife Habitat. <clears throat> Rose has provided gardening tips on our local NBC6 channel and nationally on designing spaces. And we're looking forward to hearing her, her talk now. Hello everyone, thank you so much for inviting me to join you. I uh, always have a special place in my heart for Wilton Manners. Wilton Manners, uh, my dear friend, Emmy De Palma, was relentless in getting Wilton Manners certified as a certified wildlife habitat city, one of the first in Broward County. So it's always a pleasure to come and speak in Wilton Manors. Um, I am going to try and uh, share my screen in a second, but I do hope as you're out scouting for your rare and unusual plants that you remember that there are many rare and endangered native plants. And uh, there are some very cool native nurseries that you can go to to get some of those plants. So hopefully you'll have some rare and endangered natives on your list as well. So I'm going to try and share my screen now. Are we able to see that? Looks great. Okay, wonderful. So I like to start off a little bit about explaining South Florida's natural environment and history. This picture here is a picture of the Everglades. Um, many of you I'm sure have read The River of Grass by Marjorie Stoneham Douglas. It's, it's a great book about the Everglades. And this is basically what Florida looked like everywhere from Lake Okeechobee down to Miami. So what you see out there now is an illusion. It is not really uh, our natural environment. So how did we go from this? A soggy confusion of land and water. Uh, that's a quote from a book called The Swamp. Uh, it's also a great book if you're into uh, politics. It's the how the Everglades actually became um, a political issue to drain. And it's all the politics of paradise. And it's a very uh, interesting book if you're uh, into that part as opposed to the geological references. But now this is what we look like. 
And we in Broward County are pretty much built out. We're almost maximum built out. We do have a little bit left. Now we're going mostly up. But as you can see from this slide on the left, we have all of our houses very close together along our man-made canal system. The picture on the right shows you the canal system that was put in primarily to drain off all of that nasty water and to uh, prevent our homes from being flooding and to allow for our agriculture. But what has happened since we have done that is if you can think of that river of grass, um, as it rained, the rain would come down and get filtered through the river of grass and slowly uh, percolate down into our aquifer. And our aquifer is where we get our drinking water. It, it lies underneath the surface. It's kind of like a giant sponge. But now that we have all this development here, we've got a Publix and a Winn-Dixie on every corner. We've got our Walgreens and our CVS. We've got our three car garages and our country clubs. We have all of that asphalt. So we've now put uh, a layer of cement over that sponge and our water, when it comes down and we get our rain, hits that pavement, goes off into our storm drains and into our canal system. And a lot of that water is lost to us, uh, goes out to the ocean. We don't have the capabilities of storing it. So that is why we often have water restrictions and with the increase in population, more demands on that water, more development, more demands. So, um, Water is a big issue here in South Florida and, and it's like our gold. So we have habitat impacts, our adverse habitat impacts. We have invasive exotic plants. Uh, exotic plants are not bad as long as they are not on the invasive list. Uh, and we have, of course, our beneficial native plants. So naturescapes are Florida friendly landscapes that conserve water, reduce pollution and create habitat to attract our native and migratory wildlife. We have quite a few naturescapes here in Broward County. You can become a naturescape one of two ways. If you uh, are recognized by the University of Florida as a Florida yards and neighborhood, that is one way. The other way is to get your yard certified with National Wildlife Federation. And they are one of the oldest um, ecological conservation groups in the country. So if you are certified by NWF or recognized by the University of Florida, either one of those two designations will automatically get you recognized as a naturescape in Broward County. So we're going to talk a little bit about wildlife, uh, birds and butterflies, uh, primarily in this lecture. But people do have a weird uh, concept of what preserving wildlife is. And it's unfortunate that a lot of the chances that we get to see the wildlife is in controlled situations. Um, going to have to go to zoos or going to butterfly world to see our butterflies. I love butterfly world. I think it's great. I take my grandkids there, but I also want to be able to see those butterflies in my yard. I don't want to have to drive to go see them. So what we plant certainly makes a difference on what we see in our yards. So why do we want to attract wildlife? Well, as I said, we took away everything. When a developer comes in, they have that piece of land. They want to get as much uh, buildings on it as they possibly can. They usually strip it of all of its native uh, plant, plant life and put in uh, non-native plants that will grow fast. They can get their occupancy permits and they're off and gone. But now we've displaced all of that for our native wildlife. So it's important to maintain an ecological balance. And we need to start thinking about how we're going to incorporate these wildlife habitats into our urban design. It doesn't have to be one thing or the other. We can invite everybody back to join us. So we want to help to uh, enhance that extended food chain. And we want to provide a nesting and roosting habitat for our native and migratory birds, as well as butterflies and other wildlife. We want to minimize the adverse human impacts on wildlife. We have a loss of plant species and a loss of plant communities. Uh, we have a loss and fragmentation of our habitat. 
and loss and degradation of our natural resources, and of course, soil erosion. And it's nice to be able to create wildlife viewing opportunities. Native plants help to provide that balanced and healthy ecosystem. Our native wildlife and our native plants have co-evolved and they have a mutualism. They are dependent on each other and one can often not survive without the dependency on the other. So we want to try and mimic nature as much as we can and uh, help to provide that balance and bring it back so that our wildlife will come back. What about invasive plant species? So, you know, people talk about natives A nature scape does not have to be totally native, but native plants are better for our wildlife. So we encourage it. You can have native plants and you can have exotic plants. I have quite a few exotic plants. I have an orchid in my backyard blooming now that's about three feet long and I've been boasting about it on my Facebook page. So I have my exotics as well. But what we don't wanna do is get caught up in planting invasive plant materials. And an invasive plant is one that is not native to a particular ecosystem whose introduction does or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. It is capable of moving aggressively into an area, monopolizing light nutrients, water, and space to the detriment of our native species. So some of the stuff is great when we get it, if we keep it in a pot, some of the stuff, if you let it loose and gets out into the wild and gets into our natural areas, overtakes our natural areas and pushes out all of our native foliage. Some people will say, oh, well, you know, the native plants aren't exactly as pretty as the non-native plants. And it's true, a lot of uh, exotic plants have been hybridized for larger blooms. Um, our roses have been hybridized so much that most of them don't even have a scent to them anymore. But if you look on these few slides here, you'll see this is Wedelia on the left. This is a category two invasive exotic. Once you have this in your yard, it spreads and you'll be ripping it out forever. Now, if you wanted that daisy-like sunny yellow face, it, you can go with the dune sunflower, and this is a Florida native. The Mexican petunia on the left is a category one invasive exotic and unfortunately we see it sold everywhere. And why is it sold everywhere? Because you can't kill it. Everybody has a green thumb if they plant this. So it goes in the shade, it goes in the sun, it spreads by rhizomes, it, it travels all over the yard, it has seeds that, uh, that spurt out of it. It is uh, an awful plant and a lot of the box stores and the nurseries carry it because in the state of Florida alone, this plant alone brings in $13 million a year just selling this one plant. So if you go to the nurseries and you buy this plant, they're going to keep selling it because they know they can move it. If people stop buying it, they will stop selling it. On the right, we have a Florida native that is also a Ruelia. Its flower is not as large and it comes in four in a cluster, but it's that same beautiful bluish violet color. So go with the native. The lantana on the left is a problem. It's a category one invasive exotic. They're quite beautiful and colorful and the butterflies go to them. So what's the problem? The problem is the seeds and um, that they will also hybridize with our wild lantanas as well. So uh, try not to buy that. Go with the wild sage, which is a Florida native. On the left, we have the Christmas cassia. This is a category one invasive exotic. You can get the same look with the Bahama Cassia on the right, which is a Florida native and is host plant for our sulfur butterflies. Also, we have the porter weed. A lot of times you'll see the non-native porter weed in the nurseries. It's harder to find, rare and unusual, the porter weed that is the Florida native, but the Florida native is by far superior, a lot less maintenance, a lot less pruning. It has more of a spreading habitat habit to it, uh, as opposed to the nettle leaf porter weed, which grows more upright. But you do need to take your botanicals 
with you because they are both porter weed and they are both stachyla taffeta, but we want the Jamaicansis. So try and look for the native porter weed. It's a wonderful butterfly attracting plant. You may have heard in the news about our migratory birds in decline. Nearly 20% of our wetland birds are on the watch list because we have displaced so much of our wetlands. Wetland loss has accelerated by 140% since 2004. And here in Florida, we are on the Atlantic Flyway. This is a migratory path for uh, birds in North America. There are four major flyways. We will have birds that will migrate from the Central Flyway to the Mississippi Flyway and join the birds on the Atlantic Flyway on their migration to and from Florida. So we have a huge migratory route here. We have some birds that are migrating over 2,000 miles, particularly the little hummingbirds um, that will be coming from Colorado. Uh, so they're going to be coming down. Uh, we get the ruby-throated hummingbirds that come down here in Florida. They don't stop here in Florida. They go from Florida across the waters to the Caribbean or across the Gulf into Mexico. So I don't know about you, but I've flown to Colorado to see friends and I'm exhausted and I'm just taking a plane. So I'm not just <laughs> flying the whole way myself at 2000 miles. By the time I get to Florida, I'm thirsty and I'm hungry. And uh, hummingbirds need to have an awful lot of fuel to take them on their journey. So it's very great if we plant a lot of uh, nectar plants that can boost them with sugar and give them energy to help them on the rest of their flight. We wanna try and keep our common birds common. Over one third of our common land bird species have declined by more than 30% since 1970. This is 3 billion North American birds that have vanished since 1970. Now, a lot of this is due to the fact that their habitats have been affected by degradation and intensifying agriculture. Uh, a lot of it is due to urban sprawl, uh, fragmentation of the forest, and also they face other human caused threats such as pesticides, domestic cats, and collisions with windows. So the biggest losses that we've had are in our common species, sparrows, warblers, and starlings. This is a map here that shows the green infrastructure of urban tree canopy in Broward County. This is just our urban area, uh, does not reflect any of our conservation lands, but the county's goal is to have an urban tree canopy of 40%. If you look at this map, the darker green areas on the air are at a maximum 20 to 39%. The lighter green areas on the air uh, are zero to 19% tree canopy. So as we have these birds coming through uh, Broward County, we can see that they don't have a lot of tree canopy in that central core, and we're working to try and restore those trees. The more trees you can plant on your property, the better to give these birds a place to nest and rest. So the concept is that we have sensitive landscape areas like our parks. Our parks are wonderful here in Broward County. We've got some really great parks, but they can't be enough. In order to sustain wildlife, in order to sustain uh, what, we've, uh, what we have and to encourage the migration uh, of the birds through here, we need to provide them with landscaped areas. So if we can take the, lands the sensitive landscaped areas like the parks and then build out from those into say the schools and into private properties where we can plant some of these plants, then we, we have what we call a movement corridor from one to the next. And the goal of Naturescape is to have people plant uh, in this resilient way for wildlife so that we can have a nature scape every quarter of a mile. And that would provide uh, our local wildlife, our native wildlife and the migratory wildlife with a movement corridor. So how can we attract wildlife? It's really very simple and very easy. There are only four major elements that you need to think of. We need to provide them with food, 
water, cover, and places to raise their young. Now, food does not mean that you have to put out bird feeders and things of that sort, though you certainly can. Food can be uh, larval host plants for butterflies, for mama butterfly to raise her young on. It can be plants that produce seeds or nectar. Uh, water, if you live on a canal, a lot of us live on a canal. Some HOAs have um, stormwater retention ponds or lakes on the property. But if you don't have that, you can put up a bird bath or a simply puddling station for butterflies. Cover is going to be any of your uh, trees and shrubs where uh, wildlife can take refuge from predators and also from inclement weather. And places, of course, to raise their young can be also those larval host plants or they can be trees where birds can nest in. We do have migrating butterflies also through Florida. So not only do we have migrating birds, we do have migrating butterflies. And the spring and fall migrations of the monarchs come through here. If you look at Florida, you can see on this uh, map here, this purple portion here on South Florida, kind of from Lake Okeechobee down, we do also have a resident population of uh, monarchs as well. So we do get the migratory monarchs through here and we do have our resident population of monarchs. If you go to the Naturescape website and you just do broward.org slash Naturescape, it will take you there. We do have this brochure that you can download and print from your computer. This lists all the native larval host plants and the butterflies that they attract. So it's a nice little flyer. It'll show you the butterfly and it will also show you what the caterpillar looks like. And it will give you the host plant to plant for that butterfly. In order to have a successful butterfly garden, you need to have two types of plants. You need to have your nectar plants, uh, which are all your flowering plants, uh, mostly ones with tubular uh, flowers on them, the butterflies like that. The larger the tubular flower, the larger the butterfly it attracts or hummingbird and also the larval host plants. This is where a butterfly is very specific to where she will lay her eggs. Most people are familiar with the fact now that monarch butterflies need milkweed. So we do need to plant milkweed for the monarchs. That is the only plant the monarch butterfly is gonna lay her eggs on. All the other butterflies are also host specific. So up here in the top left-hand corner, you can see this uh, passion vine. So if you plant the passion vine, there are three native Florida butterflies that use that as their host plant, the Gulf fritillary, the Julia, and our zebra longwing. So just planting that one plant, you're providing a nursery for three different butterflies. So if you have a butterfly on there that you say, oh, that's really cool. I want to have that butterfly. It's quite beautiful. You will be told what plant to plant to attract that particular butterfly to your yard. We have a butterfly life cycle. The adult butterflies are primarily only going to be uh, drinking from the nectar plants, um, ovulating and copulating and having sex. And uh, so they're just drinking and having sex is most of it. And then they're going to be laying their eggs. Uh, the eggs they lay on their host plants, the caterpillars then hatch from those eggs, the caterpillars then form the chrysalis and we have the cycle start all over again. Before I worked for the county, I used to work in the uh, landscaping industry here in South Florida. And I can't tell you how many times I would have people call me on the phone and say, I've planted a butterfly garden and I have something that's eating all the plants. What can I spray it with? And you would be shocked to know how many people don't realize that the caterpillars actually become the butterflies. And we do not want to use any pesticides in our butterfly gardens. And I have not used any pesticides in my yard uh, in over 20 years. So again, here are some of the butterflies. These are the three butterflies that I mentioned before, the zebra longwing, our state butterfly, uh, the Gulf fritillary and the Julia. This is what the caterpillars look like. Now, if you have a small yard and you don't have a big yard and there's only a few plants and you wanna be selective, plant this corky stem passion vine or the incense 
passion vine. They're both native to Florida and they provide a nectar source for the uh, butterflies. And then they also produce these little tiny little seeds of fruits on them that the birds will go after. The other plant that's worth planting in your yard is the native firebush. The native firebush has these tubular red flowers on them, which attract both um, butterflies and hummingbirds. And then they do produce these little seeds and fruits on them, which the birds actually love. So just planting these two plant species, you would be attracting all of this different wildlife to your yard. These are some native plants that provide nectar. Uh, the coral bean, the tropical sage, the salvia is, is a wonderful wildflower. The porterweed, which we talked about briefly earlier, uh, try and get the native porterweed. Uh, the coral honeysuckle, which I have in my yard now, is blooming like crazy. The hummingbirds just love it, and I have some hummingbirds in the yard that visit that and the firebush. Um, they also visit some of the bromeliads as well. The bromeliads with, the, uh, with their vibrant red inflorescence on them will attract the hummingbirds. And this is our native mist flower. So all of these plants would provide nectar, but they are not a larval host plant. And if you, um, you can kind of think of it like if you're going to McDonald's, you go in, you're there really quick, you grab your burger, you probably have it half eating before you've gone out the, the gate. That's how the butterflies are. If you just have the nectar plants in your yard, they're gonna come in, they're gonna have the nectar and they're gonna be off. But if you want them to stick around, you need to have the larval host plants for the mommy butterfly. That's kind of like going to a family restaurant. So mommy can have her drink and she can have her glass of wine. The kids can have their chicken fingers and their pizza because that's all they eat. And so if you plant those larval host plants that are specific, the mommy butterfly, when she comes through and is drinking from the nectar plant says, aha, I also can have my babies here. And you will have the butterflies hanging around your yard much more if you plant the larval host plants. So this is the native firebush. There is a non-native firebush um, as well. It's kind of hard to tell the difference between the two, but our uh, native firebush has kind of a fuzzier leaf to it. It's more salt tolerant. The hybrid uh, firebush is also called Hemelia patens, so it's very confusing. When you go to the nurseries, please ask for the native plant if you can. The um, If it says dwarf on it, if it says it's a dwarf firebush, it is not the native. So look for the, the native. It grows rapidly to about 10 feet. You could keep it as a shrub or as a small tree uh, or a hedge. The berries attract the birds. It will take full to partial sun. And once they are established, it has a very high drought tolerance. Most of our native plant species, once they are established, require less water. So they are uh, more ecologically sound planting natives. Use plant combinations that may appeal to more than one species or more than one phase of life. Here on the left, we see the Atala butterfly. It's a beautiful little black butterfly with iridescent blue on it and a red abdomen. The caterpillar is here. It's red with these little yellow dots on it. The Kunti plant is the larval host plant for the Atala butterfly. So the Italo was almost extinct in Broward County. People have been planting the Kunti over the past five years and they've made a fabulous comeback. I do want to give you one warning with the Kunti. If you do have dogs that tend to eat plants, uh, the seeds of the Kunti are toxic, uh, toxic to dogs. Uh, I've never had a problem with my dog eating my plants, but I do have a rescue dog now that I don't trust with uh, since he was starving and found on the streets of Miami he eats anything that hits the ground. So I don't have any of the Kunti plants in my backyard. Uh, I do have them out in my front yard where the dog would be on a leash, but in the backyard because of Remington we don't keep them back there. So do have that warning if you do have the dog. This here other plant here, the bloodberry or the butterfly sage is a native plant. This will attract the butterflies as a nectar source and also will attract our birds for the berries that uh, it provides. 
So when we think about butterfly gardens, we usually think about those little flowering plants. We don't often think about foliage plants, trees and palms that also can be a larval host plants. So um, they also provide twigs where the butterflies can roost on them. So these are some native plants and these are the butterflies that they attract. So again, if you see something like these gorgeous swallowtails, who would want to have those in your yard? Um, their larval host plant is citrus. And with citrus greening and citrus canker and all the citrus that has been taken away from Florida, we've lost over 60% of our citrus groves. They are having a hard time, but you can plant wild lime. It is thorny. So you wanna put it in a spot that's kind of away from everything else in the yard, or maybe in an area where you wanna detour people from jumping over a fence and to your yard. Um, but the wild lime is great for them. And I have, uh, many swallowtails in my yard. So when you pick the butterfly that you want to see, just plant the uh, larval host plant. Even our native strangler fig is a larval host plant for the ruddy dagger wing. Here is the wild lime plant on the left and the giant swallowtail. And the caterpillar has camouflaged itself as bird poop. So it uh, kind of deters the birds from going after it. Again, this is the Itala and the Kunti. The Kunti is a great plant, especially if you don't like to do a lot of pruning. And as I get older, I'm trying to do more plants in the yard that are lower maintenance. It only grows from one to four feet tall. So it's easily managed in the landscape. It's a low maintenance shrub. Uh, it's easy to keep small. It's highly adaptable to many growing conditions. It will take full sun to deep shade. It's again, the sole larval host plant for the Itala hair streak butterfly. And again, I mentioned the seeds are toxic to dogs. If eaten, they'll kid their kidneys will shut down. The Simpson stopper is a great plant. More people should plant this one. It's wonderful for pollinators. It grows to about 10 foot high as a shrub or can be pruned into a small tree. It's good as a hedge plant. The blooms on it are fragrant and it blooms all year attracting pollinators. Again, it gets orange berries that attract the birds. So anything that's gonna native that's gonna produce seeds and berries on it are always a plus for the birds. It will take full to partial sun it has a high drought tolerance and a high salt tolerance. And as uh, Wilton Manors is close uh, to the ocean, we are getting more and more saltwater intrusion uh, as we have more and more water demands on our aquifer and as sea levels rise. So uh, start thinking about planting more salt tolerant plants. Uh, for the black swallowtail, this water dropwort, very hard to find. You could put it on your rare list. Uh, they will also use some herbs as well. They will use uh, parsley and dill to lay their eggs on. If you have a large enough yard and you can have a little sp space in it for a weedy patch, just let nature take its course. Uh, obviously up by the front of the house and out by the street, we want a more formal look. But if you've got a spot in the back where you can have just a little patch and let these native plants establish themselves, they are some of the best things for our native pollinators and our native bees. The Spanish needles, you'll see those a lot. They tend to spread a lot, so be careful. Um, you know, some of these things uh, will take over, so you want to make sure that you have them in an area that you can manage. Uh, the false nettle here, I was pulling this out of my yard all the time. I thought it was weed until I found out it was also a larval host plant. For the red admiral, I had this red admiral coming around my yard. Um, 
I'd find him puddling by the pool. The male butterflies like to puddle. Um, and I was saying, well, what's attracting this butterfly to my yard? What do I have that's bringing these butterflies here? What larval host plant are they looking for? And when I researched it, I saw that it was the false nettle. And lo and behold, I had been pulling it out because I thought it was a weed. <coughs> Excuse me. So now I leave a little bit of it for him. <coughs> Coral honeysuckle vine is beautiful. Um, mine is blooming like crazy right now. It can also be hard to find, so it can go on your rail list. Hummingbirds absolutely love it. Uh, it's a wonderful wildlife plant. It also gets little teeny berries on it, which the mockingbirds love. These are our two native passion vines, the uh, Passiflora incarnata and the Suberosa, the corky stem and the incense passion vine. Now, just because they're vines doesn't mean you need to have them on a trellis. This corky stem passion vine, if you have an area uh, where you want to put a deep ground cover, it makes a very nice ground cover and the butterflies don't care if it's on the trellis or if it's sprawling along the ground. So it will be used both as a uh, nectar plant and also as a uh, larval food plant. If you have a big piece of property and you can put a large tree on it, this wild tamarind is fantastic. It appeals to more than one species. It uh, is a larval plant for the cassia blue and the large orange sulfur. And it also attracts the uh, blue gray net catcher and the painted buntings. The painted buntings do migrate through here. I do get them in my yard. They like the plants that have tiny seeds on them. If you have muley grass, they love that as well with the tiny seeds. And when you put out your bird feeders uh, during migration time, uh, the smaller seeds will usually attract the smaller songbirds and the larger seeds such as the sunflowers are gonna attract your larger birds like the cardinals and the blue jays. But you do need a big spot for the wild tamarind. It grows rapidly to 50 or 60 feet. It is a beautiful tree with fragrant flowers from February to September. It has an attractive bark and a weeping open form. It has a high salt tolerance and a high drought tolerance. If you have a smaller yard, this little tree is very hard to find also. We do offer it on occasion at Water Matters Day. At Water Matters Day, uh, which is Broward County's largest environmental event uh, that we do on an annual basis, usually the second Saturday in March, we get up to 4,000 people that come through and we give away about $30,000 worth of plants. Uh, I try and include any of the native plants that are critically imperiled in South Florida or higher to find ones that uh, people might have a harder time finding at local nurseries. But if you're scouting for your event, uh, your sale, this is a lovely tree to have. It's a small accent or specimen flowering tree. It's uh, moderate to fast growth. It's 15 to 20 feet tall. It will take full sun. It does prefer a well-drained soil, very drought tolerant, showy yellow flowers in the spring and the summer, good for providing food and cover for wildlife and critically imperiled in South Florida. If you go to our Naturescape website or you visit the Water Matters Day pages this month, you will also see that uh, we have given an Emerald Award to one landscape architect in Fort Lauderdale, Cadence, uh, who did a beautiful landscape design and used one of these small uh, little cinecords as a focal point of the front yard landscape. And we do have videos of those award-winning homes uh, on our website. This is willow bustic, again, 20 to 30 feet tall, an accent tree, highly drought tolerant, medium salt, uh, salt tolerance, white cream fragrant flowers all year long that peak in the spring, a nectar plant for the Florida dusky wing and the red banded hair streak and other butterflies. And now who would have thought that our Florida thatch palm is also uh, endangered in the state of Florida and also is a larval host plant for the monk skipper butterflies. 
They are a slow grower. They'll grow 20 to 28 feet tall. They will take partial to full sun. They have white flowers on them and the fruit provides food for birds and pollinators. Uh, high salt, salt tolerance and high drought tolerance. Great palm to add to your landscape. As far as the little small plants, we have the beach verbena, which is a Florida native wildflower. It's fast growing. It uh, grows three to 12 inches high. It does prefer full sun. It, its name will tell you beach verbena grows along uh, our beach and sandy areas. It has these rose purple flowers all year year long. It grows best in well-drained sandy soil. It is a nectar plant for butterflies and again is listed as endangered by the state of Florida. I have seen it for sale uh, out at uh, Florida Nursery Mart down on Griffin Road and I always try and scoop some up when I see them there. And we have our blanket flower, the Gallardia. This is a very good plant for attracting butterflies. It also attracts hummingbirds. And uh, when the small seeds come in the end, if you don't deadhead them, it's seeds uh, in the fall when the migratory birds are coming through. It's a native perennial wildflower that grows one to three feet in height. And again, the flowers attract hummingbirds and butterflies and it takes full sun. The dune sunflower I showed you before is an alternative to so some of the invasive plants. It also is a, a dune plant from the beach, so it takes full sun. It's drought tolerant. It's excellent in coastal landscapes, attracts butterflies. You can use it as a ground cover, a border, or a mass planting. It looks beautiful cascading down a wall or an edging. Uh, it is a spreading perennial. The Jamaican caper is a small shrub to a small tree. Uh, it's a beautiful accent plant. It grows slowly through six to 12 feet tall. It gets these gorgeous showy white flowers that turn pink uh, in the spring and summer. It will take full sun to light shade. And it's also a larval host plant for the Florida white butterflies. It really is a beautiful shrub uh, or a small tree. The uh, blossoms on it uh, look almost like women's fascinator hats or, or remind me of orchids as well. This is a great plant. It's a bit sprawly, so I like it planted uh, in with other things, not so much as a focal point on its own. It is a native Bahama cassia. It's a fast growing shrub, two to three feet high. Uh, it takes full sun to light shade, it will perform much better in the full sun. It has a high drought tolerance. It's a larval plant for the sulfur butterflies and it blooms yellow flowers in the fall and the winter. Now, have you ever noticed butterflies gathering around puddles? I told you about that uh, admiral butterfly that I found puddling by my pool. The butterflies get enough uh, enough liquid from their nectar sources. They're not really in those puddles for the water. What they're in there for are the um, minerals that have evaporated near the surface of the water. So uh, the male butterflies need these minerals, these salts and amino acids for their reproduction. So you'll often see them on um, rocks when rocks are wet, on the sidewalk when the sidewalk's wet. You can put a little saucer out in, into your landscape, uh, fill it with sand and uh, a few rocks on it and put some water in there and the male butterflies will puddle in there. Puddling stations plus male Butterflies equals happy hour. So uh, it's very easy to make a puddling station. This person in this yard had just taken a pot and turned it over and used the saucer on the top, uh, put some gravel in there and a little bit of water and that's all you need. Wild coffee is a great native plant. It will take partial shade to full sun. It gets white flowers on it and the male butterflies tend to go to white flowers. Uh, there's something about the alkaloids in the white flowers uh, that are also good for their male reproduction. If you have just a little condo or uh, you're in a townhouse and you have just 
a, a little bit of room, you can always do a container garden. You can combine a thriller, a spiller, and a filler. So your thriller will be something tall and colorful that would be the focal point of the pot. Uh, a spiller would be your trailing vine and uh, the filler to fill in the space in between. So um, here we have some yellow top. We have the uh, passion vine again that will cascade over the pot and it's uh, filled in with the native porterweed. All of these plants are nectar and larval host plants for butterflies. So you could do a simple habitat in a container garden. Um, you could even put a small saucer with some water or sand in there. Uh, and it's very easy. You could even, if you wanted to track some of the tree frogs, put a piece of PVC pipe in there uh, for the pot frogs to hide in. So I wanna encourage all of you to think about uh, becoming a community wildlife habitat uh, and certifying your gardens. You have a lot of members I'm sure that have wonderful gardens that already provide the four elements that we need. You can certify your garden online. Uh, it's very easy. It takes a few minutes. You could do it on your smartphone. There is a $20 fee that it goes to the nonprofit, the National Wildlife Federation. They will uh, give you a free membership in their organization with that and also uh, a magazine the first year. You do not have to renew it. It's a one-time uh, one time shot and uh, they are a great conservation organization. If you certify your garden with National Wildlife Federation and you let me know, I would be happy to provide you with a free naturescape sign for your yard. We wanna restore native habitat. We wanna reduce pollution that enters our waterways and we wanna connect our children and, and ourselves to the natural world. As of February uh, in uh, 2021, we we're in the process of updating our map series. We have over 4,906 certified naturescapes in Broward County. We have 24 community wildlife habitat cities. 15 of those have reached their certification and nine of them are registered. Wilton Manors here you can see is in bold. Uh, that means it has reached its certification as well as the other cities here that are in bold. The ones that are not in bold have registered and they have certain obligations that they have to meet including certifying a certain number of yards based on their population before they can reach a community wildlife habitat designation. So with the community wildlife habitats, um, if your groups uh, want to do some things philanthropic, um, you can help with Wilton Manors, I know, does tree giveaways every year. Uh, yard certifications would help Wilton Manors as well. Uh, even though they are a certified wildlife habitat, they are supposed to get more yards certified every year. So you would be helping out Wilton Manors with that. You could also ask uh, them about any community uh, projects they have, or you may be interested in joining their wildlife habitat team. So the benefits are to the city that they are improving quality habitat on public and private lands. They're promoting protection of critical stopover habitats for our migratory birds and engaging the residents and students in community pride and stewardship. So again, if you want to certify your garden, which I'm hoping every one of you will do, uh, since I'm up to 4,900, I really would like to get up to 5,000 this spring. Uh, you only need to have these four elements. And these are the things that they will ask you on the questionnaire when you uh, go to certify. Um, food, and that's going to be your native plants or any of your plants that are providing nectar or any of your butterfly larval host plants. Um, cover your shrubs and your trees where uh, animals can have a place to hide from bad weather uh, and predators. Water, uh, as I mentioned, the water source, if you put out a bird bath or a puddling station, that's sufficient. Places to raise young, that would be your trees or your shrubs or any of your larval host plants that you plant. So it's really easy to certify. I'm sure that uh, all of you probably already qualify. 
And if you want some reading, this is a great book called Bringing Nature Home. Uh, it's by Dr. Doug Talame. And in this book, he talks about planting the right native trees and shrubs in the right native place so that we provide food and shelter available to our bugs, bees, and birds at the right time. So where can you find native plants? Here in Broward County, we have four nurseries that are Naturescape registered. Jesse Durko out in Davie has been a huge supporter for years. He also has a lot of rare and unusual plants as well as native plants. Uh, Florida Nursery Mart on Griffin Road has uh, carrying a very nice variety of native plants. Uh, Zugar Growers in Fort Lauderdale carries native plants and Runway Growers also carries native plants. As I say, we give plants away at Water Matters Day every year, but you can also check your Florida native nurseries. Um, there are some great native nurseries down in Homestead. Silent Native would be a great one to put on your list as you're out scouting uh, for your rare and unusual plants. And uh, botanical gardens, uh, if you go to Butterfly World, they have a garden center there, garden clubs, uh, clubs such as your own with your plant sales and wildlife organizations. Now, Mario did ask me about Water Matters Day. Water Matters Day, uh, we were not able to have in person last year because of COVID-19. And this year, um, we were stimmied as well. So we have a virtual Water Matters Month and we are in the third week of that right now. So if you go to watermatters.broward.org, it will take you to our site. And instead of having booths and tents to go by, we have um, a story map with a scavenger hunt. And you can win some fabulous prizes by answering some simple questions. Uh, we have a, a prize each week and we have a grand prize. Uh, part of that is a smart irrigation system and installed trees, shrubs and flowers, gardening tools, rain chains, wheelbarrows. Um, these are some of the things for week one, we had coasts uh, and oceans, and there is a question that you need to find the answer to in order to win these prizes for the coastal week. Uh, week two is Naturescape, and that's what's going on now. Uh, actually, it was last week, uh, but we you can still win these prizes by going on and answering the Naturescape question that's in the uh, survey. So you can get this beautiful copper rain tra uh, chain and a, a bird bath, uh, that book, Nature's Best Hope that I mentioned, some gardening tools. Week three is growing now, that's water conservation. Uh, they also have gifts that they're giving away. You have to answer a, a question from their site. Week four is on climate change and these things will be given away. And the final scavenger hunt, the grand prize, the backyard bonanza is worth over $5,000. Uh, they will come and install a tree uh, professionally on your property for you. Uh, we'll help you decide what tree is best for your yard. Uh, we'll provide mulch, we'll provide um, weed barrier. Uh, part, part of this prize is irrigation smart system with uh, pressure regulated sprays and zones and valves, a smart controller and a remote rain sensor. Uh, and also uh, gardening tools, bird baths, rain barrels, um, all kinds, all kinds of things. So I hope you go on uh, and check out the Water Matters Month uh, and do the survey and do the scavenger hunt and good luck to all of you on winning some of those prizes. But if you could do me one favor and certify your yards, I would really appreciate it. So in summary, certify your garden by attracting wildlife, providing food, water, cover and places to raise young, utilize native plants when you can, Remove invasive exotic plants from your landscape. Use sustainable gardening practices. You can certify your garden online at nwf.org slash certify. There is a $20 fee for that. 
and it's easy, it's smartphone friendly, and I would be happy to give you one of these Naturescape certified property signs for your yard if you do. All you have to do is email me with your certification number, and I'll be happy to give you a sign for your yard. And with that, I will take any questions. Hey, Rose, uh, this is Justin. I'm, I don't normally speak at this point, but as you were talking, I just went through the whole certification process. It took me less than five minutes. Wonderful. And it, it's, it's done, very easy to do. I would highly recommend people do this. Yeah, so you'll be doing Wilton Manors a favor. That surge uh, for them would be great. Uh, it would be doing me a favor, reaching that $5,000 goal. I'm, I'm about 5,000 properties that are certified. I'm at 4,900 and I'm jonesing to re reach the five. So, uh, and if you have any friends in other cities uh, in Broward County, please encourage them to do the same. Okay, I've got a um, couple of questions here for you. Um, first one is, can the county stop the sale of invasive plants? Uh, not really. They're not, they're not supposed to sell them, but they often do. And I've, I've been in negotiations with Home Depot, uh, for the past, past two years, trying to encourage them to not sell, uh, some of these invasive plants. But then again, some of the stuff that they sell that's invasive is okay if you keep it in a pot but not okay if you plant it in the ground. So part of the problem is like the Sheffalera plants. The Sheffalera plants makes a great house plant. They're an invasive plant out in the landscape. They should not be planted outside. So you don't want to let it loose. Um, some of the Sansevierias are invasive. They're fine if they're in a pot, but don't put them in the ground. The asparagus fern, you want it in a hanging basket? Great, don't plant it in your yard. It's a nasty plant anyways. It has thorns on it and you can never get rid of it once you have it out there. So, no, well, we've, we've tried to work. We, we are not an enforcement agency. The county is not into that. So um, it would be nice uh, if some of these places voluntarily did not sell them. Um, but unfortunately, like I say, it's pretty hard to go into uh, a nursery man and say, stop selling that plant when uh, the industry makes 13 million a year selling that plant. The best way to do it is to get people to stop buying them. If people stop buying them, they'll stop selling them. Okay, uh, the next question is, I planted the corky stem plant passion vine, but the butterflies ate it to death. Should I have <laughs> more than one? Um, how, do I, how do we make sure there is enough for the butterflies? I know that, well, you know, they're, they're just starving for that stuff and they're looking for it. And when they find it, um, I, I had quite a few milkweed plants in my backyard last week and this week they've, they're all eaten, but um, they will come back and the corky stem will come back. It will, it will keep going. But yeah, sometimes you need more, more than one plant out there. If you can get it going or, um, uh, maybe uh, plant more of them and, and get it going or cover it uh, with netting until it gets established. And then the more of it you have, the, the better you'll, off you'll be. Okay, next question is, I live on the seventh floor of a condo across from the beach. I have a huge patio uncovered facing east. I have had luck raising a few monarchs for the past couple of months, just wondering if there is any plant in particular that I can put up there that would help to uh, maybe get butterflies from the area as opposed to the ones that are there from the plants that I buy. I have milkweed and yeah. quarterweed, coral honeysuckle and a Mexican orange type plant. Also, should the host plants be right next to the nectar plants? Uh, they don't have to be. The butterflies are going to find them. E even if you had, you know, butterfly plants scattered throughout your yard, as opposed to, you know, all in one spot, the butterflies don't care. Uh, they do like an open sunny area. They are solar powered. They like to get their, their energy from uh, resting in the sun. So, um, any of those plants that you're planting sound fantastic. You're doing the right thing. Uh, if you're near the beach, you want to plant some salt tolerant plants, put some, um, 
You could put some dune sunflower, that beach verbena that I talked about would be great for up the air. You could even put one of the thatch palms in, in a pot out on the uh, patio. That would, that would also be nice and, and give you, uh, you know, a little vertical design out there. So uh, yeah, I would encourage you to continue what you're doing. You sound like you're doing the right thing. Okay, the next question is, um, is the NWF certification available for Palm Beach County? Yes, it is. It's, it's nationwide. Okay. So um, uh, it has, it has, um, the organization is very supportive. Um, it's one of the oldest conservation organizations uh, in the United States. So it is a national recognition when you get certified. Okay. Um, the next question is, if I have an irrigation system, will I be automatically disqualified from being certified? No, no, it has nothing, nothing to do with your irrigation. Um, now, if you're talking about uh, Florida yards and neighborhoods, that's a whole different process. There is no fee for that. And uh, the University of Florida Master Gardeners will come out and they will actually survey your yard with you and make sure that your irrigation is set properly and running properly. It's more to do with best management practices. Uh, I believe they are requiring now that you attend a workshop before they come out. Uh, and I think they have a workshop coming up, but certainly there's nothing wrong with having irrigation as long as you irrigate responsibly and you don't irrigate more than uh, two times a week. Uh, and that, um, you know, you're not set to be irrigating in the, in the hot sunny spots of the day. So uh, there's nothing wrong with irrigation when it's done properly. Okay, and I've had two people ask if you can share your email address. Oh, yeah, certainly, but it's it's long. <laughs> it's our best shard by name at Broward.org. Okay. Um, that is all the questions that we have. Okay. Well, I thank you so much for inviting me. I look forward to coming back when we could do it in person sometime and I could bring some plants to give away. Um, and I do hope to see a lot of certifications in Wilton Manors now. Okay. And, okay, I just had another question come in. Um, mm -hmm. Again, a third person asking for your email address. And it says, hey, Rose, um, have been NFW certified. How do I get a NatureScape sign? Uh, just go ahead and uh, email me and um, send me your, your certification, your certification number or your address. And um, I'll be happy to give you a sign. You can swing by my office and pick it up and I'll run down the stairs and give it to you. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And we appreciate uh -huh. you coming to speak to us tonight. And if you go, if you go on the nature, as I say, if you go on the NatureScape website, um, also there's a, a email address there for I think it's info at NatureScape, and um, they'll forward any of that stuff on that's a, as addressed to me as well. And please try and win some of those prizes. Go on the Water Matters Month uh, site and see if you can't win some of those prizes and take the survey. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, we're back. <laughs> Are we on here now? Yes. Sir. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, thank you, uh, Rose. That was a great presentation. It's incredible, very informative and delightful. Uh, I'm glad to see that I did a couple of right things, but then I found out that I didn't do some good ones. But that's another story <laughs> altogether. I'm sure that's true, practically all of us here. Uh, you know, to go and put it in context a little bit, let's remind everybody here that the uh, Equality Garden Club, we have a green initiative and we have the Island City Orchid Project. And those are examples of our commitment to supporting and enhancing uh, all our living things, right, within our communities. 
And Dark Hub encourages environmentally sensible practices that sustain the beauty and health of our public as well as our, in our private uh, uh, projects, uh, spaces. Um, I encourage everybody to subscribe to this Nature Escapes program. It looks like really interesting and no harm at all can come from it, that's for sure. Uh, we can enhance the corridors of the wildlife in the, in the habitat, in the urban and the suburban area. And from the viewpoint of the wildlife, it's, uh, our private gardens are going to be basically outlying islands uh, connecting up and uh, hopefully connecting up with our public parks. And so we support the mutual health and future of our native birds and our flora and fauna. Anyway, um, it's a good way of becoming empowered. So each of us can do something and actually do something positive and to our own benefit mm -hmm. immediately. That's good. Uh, I'm very pleased to announce, by the way, that we polled our membership and everybody was in agreement that we will go forward with this. They've, uh, they've approved the allocation of up to $2,500 to go for this uh, auction. I really would encourage everybody to go and register with this. You'll be getting information on how to do that. It's not hard. Just get onto Facebook, go to the group and sign up for it. And uh, be sure to participate. This is going to be some really, really interesting plants there. We're going out of a way to get something unusual. That's why we're calling it uncommon and unusual. It will be, no question about it. With that said, thank you so much for attending. And uh, good night to all. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay involved. Okay, good night.